Today we're going to have some fun together. I have a 10 best homemade Christmas gifts marathon and more for you. These are all very easy to make and the person who receives them will love them. I guarantee it. But don't worry if you're not one to make things homemade. At the end of this video, I have a bonus for you where I share some of my favorite kitchen tools to give and receive for creating the perfect traditional foods kitchen. Hi, sweet friends. I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. If at any time you want to jump ahead in this video, be sure to check the description where I'll have detailed timestamps. I'll also put those detailed timestamps in the pinned comment. Well, I think you're going to really love these homemade gift ideas. Pretty much all of them are edible, but at the end, I throw in a few bonus ideas for making homemade beauty creams. Now to make this exceptionally easy for you, I've broken down these homemade gifts into three categories. I've got those that are very easy and well, they're all very easy, but these are exceptionally easy to make and they can be made very quickly. In this first category, you can pull some of these gifts together literally within five minutes. They make great gifts for unexpected dinner guests. They make great gifts for hostess gifts. You know, when we're all going around and about at holiday time and you want to bring a little something if you've been invited to a dinner party, these are perfect in this simple and easy category. They also make great stocking stuffers. The second category is another easy group of gifts to make. The only thing is they may take a little bit more time and you may want to gather your ingredients. But the good news is all of these gifts primarily are made with things that you can buy right at your local grocery store. You don't have to order anything special online. The third category is also easy. However, it does take a little more time and planning. And so I leave that for the last category. But then I do have that bonus category where I talk about how to make some homemade beauty creams, including one of the most fantastic foot creams you've ever tried. So let's get started. Now the first category I want to talk about are the simple recipes. And these don't involve any cooking and they're very easy to put together. And generally what I call these gifts are the make ahead mixes. Now within the category of simple, some of these are more simple than others. And one of the most simple ones I have to make is my hot cocoa mix. But that along with the coffee creamer, which we'll talk about in a minute, are two of the most popular make ahead mixes. Now I've just put a little serving in this with some little marshmallows in this little jar with my little ribbon. Don't look too closely. I'm not a crafter. <laughs> But I know that you'll make, you can make this look really lovely with some fabric and whatnot. You can do individual servings in little jars and then you can fill a basket with them or you can just do a big serving in a big jar. Uh, whatever way that you want to do this, this is very easy to throw together. It's really just a combination of powdered milk and some whole sweetener like a sucanat or whatever you like to use and some cocoa powder. And I show you how to make it in a video and I've got the printable recipe uh, that you could even print out and attach uh, along with your jar of hot cocoa mix. Uh, I share how to make the hot cocoa mix as well as how to reconstitute it into a nice cup of hot cocoa. And what's nice about this is it is made with a whole sweetener. So like a sucanat, or you can use a maple sugar or a date sugar or a coconut sugar, uh, whatever whole sweetener you're using in your kitchen. And that has all the vitamins and minerals in it. So you're giving uh, a gift to someone that has more nutrition than just what they can buy at the store in the little package uh, that may you know, have ingredients that are not necessarily healthy for us. 
And you can also add in some marshmallows. You can add in dehydrated marshmallows if you want to just have it all together and make it easy for people to put in their cup and just add some hot water and then the marshmallows rehydrate. Or if you're just using regular marshmallows, you can put in a little piece of parchment paper that can divide the marshmallows from the cocoa mix or as one of uh, the viewers here recommended, which I thought was a very good idea and I never thought about it, was just to use one of those little uh, cupcake liners. And if you have a little mini cupcake liner for the smaller jars or even just cut it a little, uh, you know, so that it's a little shorter to fit into a small jar like this or in a big jar, put using larger cupcake holders. So I thought that was a very clever idea for holding the marshmallows if they've not been dehydrated. And then speaking of the coffee creamer, which I mentioned, you know, when I was talking about the hot cocoa mix, the coffee creamer has been very popular. And what's nice is all of these make ahead mixes that I have listed here, uh, all are shelf stable. These are all in their powder form. And so the coffee creamer mix is wonderful because you can uh, keep this in your pantry. The person you give it to can keep it in their pantry. They can take a little bit with them if they like to take some coffee creamer uh, in the car with them to work or to wherever they may be going. And so it's not something you have to worry about being in its liquid form. And you have many options for how to make a coffee creamer. You can make a coffee creamer using the, the typical you know, like non-fat powdered milk that you can buy at your grocery store, which would make a lower calorie uh, coffee creamer. You can also make your co coffee creamer with whole milk powdered milk. And you can even make it with heavy cream powder. They actually dehydrate heavy cream and you can have a heavy cream powder, which would make basically like a keto-friendly coffee creamer. And when it comes to sweetening the uh, coffee creamer, you can leave the sweetener out, or you can use a whole sweetener to add into that. And I show you a few tips and tricks to how to prepare whatever sweetener you use, whether it is like a sucanat or a coconut sugar and whatnot, uh, so that when you add that into your powdered milk, whether it's the instant non-fat or the whole, uh, whole milk powdered milk uh, or the heavy, creamer, uh, heavy cream powder, that it blends beautifully and then it blends really well when people put it into their coffee. Plus, I share with you how to flavor them. So you can make like a pumpkin pie spice, an apple pie spice, a vanilla coffee creamer. There's a whole uh, array of flavorings that you can use to add to these, add to this powdered coffee creamer, whatever uh, way you want to make it with whatever type of powdered milk or powdered heavy cream you want to use, or even a combination. You can do like one that's more like a half and half, part heavy cream powder, part milk powder. So there's a lot there. And I know many of you have asked me, is there a way to make a hazelnut powder? I haven't quite figured that one out yet. Uh, often the hazelnut flavoring is very artificial and it's in a liquid form which would no longer allow our powdered creamer to be shelf stable. But I will keep looking for you and hopefully one of these days we'll come across a, a healthy version of a uh, a powdered hazelnut flavoring. Now the other make-ahead mixes that I share involve baking. And what's nice about these is that they can be a great way to um, introduce friends and family to baking with whole grains and making it very easy for them because there are certain recipes that lend themselves very well to incorporating whole grains and whole sugars. And so I've got cookie mixes, I've got cake mixes, I have a muffin mix with a crumb topping make-ahead mix, and I also have general baking mixes. And all of them lend themselves in each of these videos and along with the recipes that you can print out for how the mix was made, as well as how to then take that mix and turn it into the particular cookie or the particular cake or whatever the case may be. And you can attach that to the jar. But for the cookies, I've got oatmeal, chocolate chip. I even have snickerdoodles, which are a wonderful cookie. 
and I've got some other good sugar cookies. I've got in the general baking mix, I've got a pancake waffle mix. I've got a Bisquick copycat mix. I've got a biscuit mix. I've got, uh, I've got the cake mixes and I've got how to make a chocolate cake as well as how to make a spice cake. And these are all make ahead mixes where the person just has to dump the jar into a bowl and then add in the wet ingredients. It's like having a box cake mix, but something that's very healthy. And you can attach the little recipe to the jar that you can print out from my website that will tell them what wet ingredients they need to add in and then what temperature to bake the cake at. Plus, I have a tip. I share a tip in there for a yellow cake mix and how to keep your yellow cake mix yellow because that is a one drawback whenever you're baking with whole grains. And for some, other, uh, for some of the other healthy baking mixes, I also have mixes uh, for brownies and cornbread. And again, all made with whole grain flours, all made with whole sugars. But don't worry, if you yourself are at the beginning of your journey from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen, and you want to, you may have started incorporating whole grains into your kitchen, but you've not yet incorporated whole sugars, don't worry. In the printable recipes for making these make-ahead mixes, I share with you how you can add white sugar if that's what you have in your kitchen right now. Because I know that when you're on this journey and you want to take this journey slow and you want to incorporate uh, traditional foods into your kitchen slowly so that you can be successful and not feel overwhelmed that many people tend to start first with incorporating whole grains and then moving on to incorporating whole sugars like your sucanat or your maple sugar date sugar coconut sugar so on and so forth so know that you can if this is if you're where you depending on where you are on your journey you can use white sugar and then one more make-ahead mix that is also very popular, uh, similar to the hot cocoa mix and the coffee creamer mix, is a cream of soup mix. And again, this is very easy for you to put together and you can make a big jar of it. My husband loves this and it is so easy to make the powdered form. And then again, you can print out all the information on my website uh, for how to make the powdered form to give as a gift, and then along with how to reconstitute it to use in a recipe. And this is wonderful because it's made from very wholesome ingredients, and you're gonna get away from having to use a can of condensed soup, which often has a lot of salt and a lot of other chemicals in it that we really don't want to be incorporating into our traditional foods kitchen. Plus, it's almost easier to use the homemade version because you don't have to worry about buying it at the grocery, you know, having the can of soup that you bought at the grocery store and then opening the can of soup and trying to reconstitute it. And it kind of can be kind of messy and getting it out of the can and all. The powdered version is so easy and you will reconstitute it like that and you'll have a beautiful a cream of soup mix in any variety that you want to make. You can use, you can make a chicken cream of soup mix, you can make a beef cream of soup mix, and you can even make a mushroom cream of soup mix. And I explain everything in the video and in the recipe. It's very easy to do, and it will be such a popular gift to anyone that you give it to, especially busy people who want to be able to get dinner on the table quickly, but don't want to be involved in, you know, trying to make a cream sauce and, and may be on their own journey of wanting to get away from using those cans of condensed soup. They will so appreciate this homemade powdered cream of soup mix, which is very shelf stable. Now let's move on to the medium category. Now these involve, or at least a couple of them, I've got my list here, involve cooking on your part but what a dream all of these are. They uh, just make lovely gifts that anyone would be happy to receive. Plus, I've got a couple of different categories to meet various dietary restrictions, <laughs> in essence. And uh, the, the first couple of ones are jam. And in 
uh, my recipe videos and then the uh, attached recipes, I'm using strawberries, but you can use any uh, fruit that you have on hand. And you can also use frozen fruit to make these jams. And if you're doing this next year, you could even make them in the summer because in the video, you know, when this fruit is in season, because in each of these videos, I show you how to water bath can these fruit jams once you've made them to make them shelf stable, which make them perfect for giving as gifts. Now, one of the jams I show you how to make is a low sugar strawberry jam, uh, which still has that really wonderful sort of sweet flavor that we associate with jam, yet we've reduced the sugar significantly, actually by half. So that can really be appreciated by a lot of folks. But then I know there are people who really look for a jam that has no sugar and I've got you covered. So I've got a no sugar strawberry jam. And again, both of these have step-by-step -step, step water bath canning instructions. So if you're new to water bath canning, I walk you through right from the beginning to the end. Nothing is left to guesswork. And you can be watching the video as you're water bath canning. You can stop the video and move on to the next step. Step by step, I walk you through the whole thing. So you've got your low sugar jam or your no sugar jam. And then the third recipe, what if you want to make jam the real old fashioned way like our grandmothers did before they had store bought or packaged pectin. I show you how to make jam without store bought pectin. And it doesn't involve you having to make your own pectin first, which I would put in the more complicated category of recipes. It's simply the old fashioned way of cooking fruit uh, so that you don't need uh, the pectin that you would get at the store or even a homemade version of pectin that you might make from crab apples or something like that. It's just the old fashioned slow cooked jam uh, that's very delicious and made with no pectin. And again, I show you how to water bath can it. Now, another recipe that I want to share with you that also makes a wonderful um, homemade Christmas gift. And this sort of goes hand in hand in many ways with the cream of soup mix. Now the cream of soup mix is very easy to make. This next uh, one I'm gonna talk to you about is a little more involved, but will be very much appreciated by whomever you give this gift to. And it's a vegetable bouillon. It's a homemade vegetable bouillon. And there's two ways that you can give this to someone depending on um, the level of refrigeration that you're ready to uh, basically give this if you do give this to someone as a gift. Um, and what I mean by that is I show you in one video how to make a homemade vegetable bouillon. And it involves salt and a lot of different types of vegetables. And you grind it all up and basically it's in the form of a wet paste. Now you can keep this in your refrigerator or you can keep it in your freezer. Because of all the salt, it's not gonna freeze solid. I'll normally make a big batch and have one in my fridge that I'm using on a regular basis and then another in my freezer to replace the one in my fridge when I use all of that up. And you can just scoop out what you need. It lasts a long time in the fridge as well, again, because of the level of salt. And if someone wants uh, to have a vegetable broth, they can simply scoop some of that out add hot water, and they can have a lovely vegetable broth to drink, or they can scoop some out, put it in a soup pot, add in some water, and they've got their base for making any type of soup that they wanna make, whether it's a vegetable soup or a bean soup or, or any soup really. It just makes this wonderful, richly flavored base to make a soup or a broth or even a sipping broth. And so I love this. And it's really not hard to make because it's just, you know, a little chopping on your part of veggies, throwing them into your food processor with your salt and whirling it all up and then decanting it into whatever container that you want. But you can take this one step further, which I show in a follow-up video 
for how to dehydrate this so that the person then has something that's shelf stable, basically a, sh a shelf stable vegetable bouillon. And you don't need any special equipment. Yes, if you have a dehydrator, that's wonderful. You can dry it in your dehydrator, but you can also dry this in your oven. And there's no special technique involved where you have to try to crack the oven and open. I don't, I don't like getting into drying things that way. I always feel it's a little dangerous. Um, basically, you're just going to, as I'm a former New Yorker, we say smear out. <laughs> You're going to just smear uh, some of the vegetable uh, bouillon out as thin as you can on some parchment paper, put it in your oven on a low temp, and just it'll dry out and it'll become this wonderful powder you can just... Uh, basically break up in your hands or if you want to put it you know into a grind a little grinder or a, a blender and make it a super fine powder you can definitely do that too but now you've made something that's shelf stable and you can fill up a big jar of that you know it's relatively reasonable to make um, i do like to use a a good quality salt you know but salt really any type of salt you use is usually very reasonably priced but I like to use a nice sea salt and you can make a nice big jar of that it's basically going to have some tomato uh, some celery some onions it's things like that and you can make a nice big jar of that somebody can put that on their shelf in their pantry and it just streamlines the whole dinner process or lunch process depending on what you're making and then the nice thing is it's very wholesome it's sea salt and a lot of vegetables when you look at the ingredients of bouillon cubes or bouillon powder at the grocery store there's a whole host of ingredients in there that I can't even pronounce and so being able to get away from that and getting to something that's wholesome and not only using that in your own kitchen but giving that to a, f a family member or a friend who you're helping to try and encourage on that journey from a processed foods kitchen to a traditional foods kitchen this is a great introduction or maybe they're already on their journey and they really appreciate these types of things um, because yes it's relatively easy to make, but sometimes depending on what someone's schedule is like, making this for them can be so appreciated. Now let's move on to the little bit of what I call the more advanced category. These are not difficult to make by any stretch of the imagination, but they do require a little more time and preparation on your part. The first recipe I want to talk to you about, in a way, takes us back to uh, the jam recipes that we talked about in the medium category. This isn't an, exactly a jam, it is a marmalade. And a marmalade takes a little longer to make than a fruit jam. So that's why I've put this in the advanced category. When making a marmalade, and the marmalade recipe I share is a three citrus marmalade and it's delicious, you're going to use the zest of a grapefruit and of an orange and of a lemon. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful combination. But as I said, making a marmalade is a little more involved because you do have to uh, remove all of the zest from the citrus and you have to cook that before you even move on so that you're kind of removing some of the bitterness of any pith that is on your zest. And then once that's cooked, then you move on to the stage of actually making the marmalade. So if you have any family or friends who really like marmalade, they'll be so thrilled to receive a homemade marmalade. And these do not require any added pectin because with the zest and the pith uh, of a citrus-based marmalade, you've got a lot of natural pectin in there. So this is another jam, or in essence a marmalade, I should say, that you can make without pectin. And when I say without pectin, I mean without store-bought pectin. But this is a wonderful marmalade recipe. Plus, in that video, I walk you through step by step how to water bath can your marmalade once you've made it and got it into the jar. And I'm there right from start to finish, so there's no guesswork. So if you're new to home canning and you're new to water bath canning, that's a great video because I go over all the equipment you need and then we go through all the steps of home canning our marmalade.
And the next recipe I want to share with you is a little more involved, but it's really time that you're not doing anything. It's just time that you have to set aside to allow you to reach the point where you can make this recipe. And what I'm talking about is making homemade bouillon powder. Now, it's not vegetable bouillon, which is very well, relatively easy. I put it in the medium category, but it's relatively easy to make. What I'm talking about is how to make chicken bouillon powder, turkey bouillon powder, or beef bouillon powder. And you're going to make this homemade. Now, you can make these bouillon powders from bone broth, which is what I highly recommend you do, or you can just make it from a broth, which is a little weaker, or you can make it from a stock, which is generally just made with bones. Now, I know it can be a little confusing. I have a video uh, where I share with you the difference between broth, stock, and bone broth. And basically, just a quick little review is uh, broth is generally made from things that are meaty with just a little bit of bone. Stock is generally made uh, from just bones with very little meat on them. And then bone broth is made from meaty bones. So, you know, more meat and less bone. Marrow bones, which are generally the ones that are used to make stock because they don't have or have very little meat on them. And then the third category is high cartilage bones, like oxtails or patellas or knuckles or neck bones. So it's that three combination of bones that make bone broth, which make it the most nutritious and often the one that's the most gelatinous. So it's very high in gelatin. And as we know from scientists, the gelatin in bone broth is so nourishing for us. It nourishes our gut, it nourishes our hair, our skin, our nails. It's just very good and very nourishing. And so if you want, you can make your bouillon powder. And this is a bouillon powder that's going to be shelf stable. You can make your bouillon powder from your homemade bone broth. So for example, say you've made chicken bone broth and you've really defatted it very well. And now you're left with just the bone broth you can dehydrate that bone broth. And again, you don't need any fancy equipment. Yes, if you have a dehydrator, you can certainly use it, but you can also put this into your oven, again, in a very shallow dish, you know, a couple of very shallow dishes, and put this into your oven, again, with the door closed, as I've shared, I'm not one for having the door cracked open, I always worry about that. Uh, but you just wanna get the lowest setting, in your oven, put your bone broth in there to, to dry up. It'll dry up. And then basically, whether you do it in the oven or in the dehydrator, when it's all dried up, it almost looks like stained glass. You know, it's like going to be in little chips and you're going to be able to look through it. Then what you do is you take this and you pulverize it either in one of those little coffee bean grinders or the blender. You can do, if you've got one of those fancy high-speed blenders, you can do it like in 30 seconds. And now you have bouillon. Now, you can keep it just as is, or, you know, especially for people that you know who may not like to take a lot of salt, so you can make this fabulous, very nutritious, homemade bouillon powder that's going to add fabulous flavor to whatever the person wants to use it for, or at, without any salt, and then let them determine how much salt they want to add into their recipe. Or, at this point, you can go ahead and add in your sea salt, and you just want a very fine ground sea salt that's dry, uh, that's very dry. You don't want one of those heavy, wet uh, Celtic gray sea salts. Uh, if you do add that, uh, you would want to then have to re-dry it. So I don't recommend that. You just want a very dry, fine uh, sea salt or whatever, sea, or whatever salt you have on hand. And when you go to pulverize your bone, uh, your bone broth that's been dried, you can add in your salt at that point. But I highly recommend uh, keeping in mind to whom you may be giving the bouillon powder and if they would appreciate something that is salt-free.
And what's nice about homemade bouillon powder is if you have someone in your family or a friend who is buying these bone broth powders and taking them, you know, for energy or the collagen or whatever the case may be, this can actually replace that because when you go to reconstitute this, say you want to use this as a drink, you're going to take that, say you've made your chicken bouillon powder, you're going to take that chicken bouillon powder and you're going to put that in a mug and you're going to add some hot water. It's going to uh, immediately uh, dissolve and become this lovely sipping broth. And if you went and put that in the refrigerator, it would gel up again just like your bone broth that you made, uh, that if you're making it properly and, you know, not boiling it and all of that, you know, which I go over and I have many recipes, uh, many videos on making bone broth. Uh, and all that collagen will still be intact. And you'll have, you know, so if you put that cup into the fridge, it would be gelatinous uh, once it cooled down. So now you've given someone this wonderful, uh, chicken bouillon powder, which is basically a bone broth powder, or if you made beef bone broth, you've given them a, a bone broth powder, uh, a beef bone broth powder. Uh, we think of it as bouillon, you know, as home cooks, but these are wonderfully appreciated gifts, uh, not only to the home cook who wants to incorporate these into her recipe, but to people who enjoy taking them for the nutritional value. So it's a little more involved in your part that you're making your bone broth and then you're drying it and then you're pulverizing it. But it is the type of gift that people are really uh, flabbergasted uh, when they receive it because uh, they know the time that goes into making bone broth and having it homemade uh, is very special. And also on our part, especially when it comes to making chicken bone broth, it's not a costly endeavor. You know, I often say you can make chicken bone broth for pennies a jar and being able to dehydrate that into a bouillon powder and, you know, using many of your jars of it to get, because it's amazing how one small jar, once you dehydrate it, uh, will, uh, you know, about a tablespoon uh, is like a whole cup or a whole jar, you know, of bone broth. It can really dehydrate down to quite a small amount. But what a nice uh, savings that is for the person to whom you're giving it to, because even though making chicken bone broth is a relatively reasonable endeavor, the time involved does add up. And yet it's amazing to me how expensive these chicken uh, bone broth powders are because even with the time involved, uh, we can still do them very reasonably because if you have a, a couple of chicken carcass and a couple of chicken feet, you can make an incredibly rich chicken bone broth. And then to dehydrate that, you're making a wonderful natural delicious and very rich in nutrients and especially collagen uh, bone broth powder, chicken bone broth powder or chicken bouillon. So people, it's very versatile. Use it in a recipe or turn it into a sipping broth. Either way, depending on who you're thinking of in terms of your family or your friends, uh, you can say this is something you can use as a base to make soups and stews or add it to your water when you're making grains, or if you're giving it to someone who really enjoys sipping broth, you could say, just add a little hot water and you've got a wonderful mug of bone broth. Now I have a little bonus that I wanna share here with you. And this is not the type of gift just for anybody. This may be the best gift though for someone in your life who is truly a traditional foods foodie. And I know foodie is like a little out of date term now, but if you have someone who's full on their journey and is really running a traditional foods kitchen, I have such a clever idea for you. And this is a video that I'll definitely link to below, but I show you how to make cream, face cream and foot cream, 
by using beef tallow. And as I joke, I say, yes, ladies, that's right. We're putting beef fat on our skin. But you can add to the beef tallow, and I kind of put this in a little bit of the more advanced category, because either you're going to buy your beef tallow or you're going to render your own, uh, depending again where you yourself are on your journey and what you do. But you and all and this you really can just make in a very small jar. I usually when I give this to my friends, I'll put it like in a four ounce jelly jar because you only use a little bit and it goes a long way and it lasts a long time. That's the wonderful thing about tallow, beef tallow, is that it's very shelf stable. But you'll melt a little bit of the tallow, you'll add some essential oils and you will have a wonderful face cream. And then I make one where you can put a little lavender and a little peppermint, you know, different things like that, and to use on your feet. And I'm telling you, if you have a problem with cracked heels, I had such a problem with this for many years. My heels were so dry all the time, and they just seemed to be getting drier as I got older. And I had already started using, you know, beef tallow on my face. Now I'm in my mid 60s, and I said, you know, these feet, these heels are really getting dry. And then I said, gee, I like the way the beef tallow feels on my face and seems to, to you know, give me nice moisture. I'm going to try this on my heels. So I just added essential oils, though, that I felt like for nighttime, putting a little lavender essential oil in the beef tallow is very nice because it can help you, you know, lavender helps you uh, relax and feel sleepy. Uh, maybe for early in the day, putting in some peppermint oil, which peppermint is always great for feet. So there are different things you can do for that. So that's a little bonus tip if you, uh, if you have someone who would really enjoy the idea of receiving a homemade and very healthy cream with very few ingredients, very natural. Well, I hope you liked all those wonderful homemade gift ideas, and I'll have links to all the recipes in the description underneath this video. Now, before we move on to where I share with you my favorite kitchen tool gift ideas for the traditional foods cook, I just wanted to share a little bit with you about my recent cookbook, the Modern Pioneer Cookbook, because I know many of you have shared with me that you've not seen this or you've not had a chance to go to a bookstore to actually flip through it. And you wanted to see a little more about the cookbook than what you could see online. What you're going to find in my cookbook is that this is very much a manual to create a traditional foods kitchen. You're going to have your wonderful nutrient dense recipes, things like sardines with pickled red onions and citrus chimichurri. It's delicious, as well as more uh, traditional dishes, but ones that are made traditional in the sense of things that you hear normally in conversation. You may not hear sardines normally in conversation, but things like graham crackers. But I show you how to make them with whole grains and whole sweeteners. I also show you how to make something like chili con carne, but in the traditional way, in the way chili con carne is meant to be made, in the way that it was made by our ancestors. And so that's what this book is all about. Plus, in the beginning, I basically walk you through how to make many of the ingredients that you use later in making many of the meals. I show you how to make all types of things like pickled vegetables, fermented vegetables, all types of cultured dairy, stovetop cheeses, sourdough starter, sourdough bread. I, but I also start you out easy in the home baker section, making things like quick breads and my popular sandwich bread that so many of you have enjoyed making from my YouTube video. And most important, in the beginning of every single chapter, I start with what I call getting started. So in this one, this is getting started with homemade dairy. I don't leave you high and dry with just a lot of recipes. And 
I also, you will find that I also make sure that for pretty much every single recipe, these are ingredients, the whole basic building block ingredients that you can find at your local grocery store. Yes, if you have a relationship with a rancher, a dairy, the farmer's market, that's great. But if you don't, you can find pretty much everything you need to make anything in this book, to make any of it homemade with simple ingredients you can find at your grocery store. And you don't need to worry that it's going to be overly complicated. As a matter of fact, the only thing in this book where you may have to source something, and that's to make kefir or kefir. You would need the grains. And the only reason I included that recipe is because I really like kefir, and it's a wonderful, nutrient-rich food. However, if you don't have kefir grains, kefir grains, I have tons of other recipes in here for you in the homemade dairy section uh, that'll provide you with everything that you want to make and plenty of cultured dairy uh, products as well as cultured beverages. So the getting started section is definitely worth reading before you venture forth uh, into the recipes. And I'm there with lots of cook's notes and lots of frequently asked questions and all sorts of things like that to help you get started on your traditional foods journey. So if you want to give this book to maybe put it on your own wish list, and I hope you will, to put on your own kitchen bookshelf, I hope you'll do that. And, but if you want to give it as a gift to someone that you know is on their traditional foods journey, I think you will really find this a wonderful book. It's a manual and it will walk you through step by step. It's as though I'm right there with you holding your hand in the kitchen. Many of these recipes are in video form on my YouTube channel. So in essence, I can be in your kitchen holding your hand and walking you through it all step by step. So be sure to look for the Modern Pioneer Cookbook. It should be on the shelves at all your major book retailers, and it's also available online. And I'll be sure to put a link to it in the description below and in the pinned comment. Now I want to share with you some of my favorite gift ideas for the traditional foods cook. But before I do that, I just want to mention, be sure that you head over to my shopping guide on my website, marysnest.com, Mary's Nest, the same name as my YouTube channel, where you'll find lots of great discount coupon codes and Black Friday and Cyber Monday special deals. So don't miss out on that. I'll have the link in the description underneath this video, as well as the pinned comment. Now, on to my favorite cook's tools for the traditional foods cook. And I've broken it down into various price ranges for every single budget. Let's go check them out. Well, item number one that I want to talk about is a grain mill. Now, this is an electric grain mill, and it's one that I love. But yes, you can also have a manual grain mill, which I had for many years. But this is so affordable, it's made by Mock Mill. And keep in mind, this is not a sponsored post. These are all items that I've purchased myself and that I use almost every day. So many of us who are modern pioneers in the kitchen really like storing grain because grain can be stored for a really long time. I'm talking about whole grain. But if you store whole grain, you need a way to turn it into flour when you want to make bread. Definitely having a manual grain grinder as a backup in the event that you don't have power is wonderful. And there are a number of options available on the market. But as long as we do have electricity, I can't say enough good things about the mock mill. I love this. The whole housing is made from recycled materials, which helps keep the cost down. But it is a stone ground mill or stone grinding mill. <laughs> Not sure exactly what the right uh, terminology is, but it, it does grind the grain with stones so that it's very protective of the oils in the grain. And once you start making bread with freshly ground grain and you have that fresh milled flour, you are going to love the outcome. Your bread is going to taste fresher. You're going to get a better rise. Everything about it is going to be wonderful, especially if you like making sourdough. And if you've ever wondered if you can grind your grain, have your whole grain flour, but then turn it into something as close as possible to all purpose flour, you can do that too. You just need a sifter. These are very affordable. You can even see mine's a little bent. It's well used and well loved. And you just sift out the bran and the germ. 
then you have something that's very close to all-purpose flour. And then all you need to do is store it. This is a nice airtight container that I keep mine in, and I have it ready to use every day. And my grain, my whole grain, I store in five-gallon buckets. And if you've seen my video where I go into a lot of detail about how to store food, especially whole grain, to keep it as fresh as long as possible, I'll be sure to link to that in the iCards and in the description below in case you did miss it. Number two, is fermentation equipment because as modern pioneers in the kitchen we love making traditional foods including not only sourdough but also ferments. Making ferments is very easy and I have a very detailed playlist which I'll be sure to link to in the iCards and in the description below so that you can learn if you're new to it. Now there are a lot of varieties of fermentation equipment out there but my favorite one is the Mason Tops fermentation kit. And I've also got a coupon code for you, so be sure to check that description underneath this video. What I love about their kit is that it comes in a box that is fantastic for storing everything once you've washed it and dried it. Now you do need to supply your own jar, which if you're a home canner, that's usually something you have on hand, and you'll need a canning ring. And what the Mason Tops kit comes with is what I call the Kraut Pounder, you often use when making sauerkraut, but it works great for pounding down any vegetables because that's the whole point of fermentation. You want to compress it as tightly as possible and keep everything under the brine. And to help with the process of keeping everything under the brine, you've also got these little glass, I believe they call them pickle pebbles. Now, if you are a home canner, yes, I do like mason tops, but I have to tell you that I often use a four ounce jelly jar also, and I'll just put that right into my jar. So if you don't have the pickle pebbles, the four ounce jelly jar works great too to hold everything under the brine. Then once you get everything submerged under your brine, weighted down with your pickle pipe or your, your uh, little jelly jar, because all of these things are sold individually. So you don't need to buy everything together if you don't wanna use the pickle pebbles and you just wanna use the jelly jar. Uh, then all you do is put your pickle pipe on top of your jar and then you screw it on to hold it in place with your lid, well, with your ring. <laughs> and the nice thing about these pickle pipes is there's a tiny little hole here that'll allow the CO2 gas that builds up during the fermentation process to be released, yet then it quickly closes and doesn't allow any oxygen in because it's the air that's kind of the enemy of fermentation. So it's a wonderful system. And then you don't have to worry about, as I've shared with you in many of my fermentation videos, you don't have to worry about burping the jar. You can just let your jar ferment and then it'll be ready for you depending on how many days you allow it to ferment without having to worry about every day unscrewing the lid and letting out the gas and then screwing the lid again. So it's good if you find yourself getting a little preoccupied and forgetting to release the gas. Uh, this does the job for you. And the nice thing about this kit is it comes with this lovely little cookbook. It talks all about fermentation, plus it shares a bunch of recipes, including how to make sauerkraut, how to make kind of a spicy sauerkraut, so similar to a kimchi, how to make fermented pickles, how to make fermented carrots, and a whole bunch of other things. So if you're new to fermentation, I can't say enough about this. I've been very pleased with the mason tops. Yes, as I said, there are other ways to make ferments, but this system just works real smoothly. So be sure to check the description underneath where I'll have a link for the discount coupon code. Number three, let's talk about culturing. Whether you're making homemade yogurt, or you're making kefir or kefir, or you're making kombucha, Cultures for Health has the most amazing selection of starter kits and I have a coupon code for you in the description below. Now, do you need a culture to make homemade yogurt? Not at all. You can definitely just get some plain yogurt from your grocery store. Just make sure it has live cultures in it and yogurt is very easy to make. I have a video where I go into a lot of detail with you and I'll be sure to link to that, but I'll quickly go over the, the process here with you. Now, all you need is two bowls. You don't need a machine. If your bowls have lids like this, that's terrific, but if not, you can definitely use plastic wrap. You just want one bowl that can fit nicely into another bowl. You're gonna put your milk and your culture or your plain yogurt, a little bit of your plain yogurt from the grocery store into your milk. Then you're gonna put your smaller bowl into your larger bowl. Ah, lower that down. And then you're gonna fill this bowl, the larger bowl, all around the smaller bowl with warm water. Then you're gonna go ahead and cover your smaller bowl. Then you're gonna cover your larger bowl, wrap everything up maybe in a dish towel, a couple of dish towels, 
keep it nice and warm, put it in a cozy place. I usually put it in my oven that's turned off, but with the electric light on, you might have a pilot light and it'll keep it nice and cozy. And in the morning, you're gonna have homemade yogurt. And you know what's great about that? Now you can use your homemade yogurt to make all your future batches of yogurt. You don't have to buy plain yogurt from the grocery store anymore, and you don't have to buy any kind of cultures anymore, starter kit cultures. You can eat your yogurt plain, or you can add some nice homemade jam into it. I have a lot of videos where I show you how to make homemade jam. And so it's so wonderful because your homemade yogurt is gonna be a lot richer in the probiotics, the good bacteria, than anything you can buy at the store. And if you like to make kefir or kefir, Cultures for Health has, culture, has cultures for that too. You can buy the little grains, they're dehydrated, you rehydrate them, and you can start making your kefir in no time at all. It's wonderfully rich in good probiotics, and it's a nice complement to also having homemade yogurt. This way you get a variety of good bacteria into your diet. And if you like making kombucha, a big jar like this works great. Then you just need some clean cloth that you're going to put over your jar. Once you get your SCOBY in there with your liquid, your rubber band, and you're all set. And I have a very detailed video where I walk you through the entire process of making homemade kombucha. And the good news is Cultures for Health has what you need in terms of getting started to grow your SCOBY. Number four, the kitchen equipment we need for making bone broth. Well, every traditional foods cook needs a big stock pot, and there is a wide variety available to you. I really like the ones made by Le Creuset because they're lined with enamel and they come in a wide variety of sizes. This is a 20 quart, but they go all the ways down, I think to maybe a six quart or a seven quart. So whatever size household you have and whatever amount of bone broth you like making, there's a stock pot for you. And when it comes to making bone broth and you need beef bones or chickens and even chicken feet, I have a discount coupon code for you in the description below for U.S. Wellness Meats, where you can buy grass-fed, organic beef, beef bones, chickens, chicken feet, a whole host of things. Now, when it comes to making bone broth, I have a very detailed playlist where I show you how to make all types of bone broth, beef bone broth, chicken bone broth, very reasonably priced bone broths using just chicken feet that are gonna create a very gelatinous bone broth. And why do we want it to be gelatinous? Because the gelatin really soothes our digestive system. And I'll be sure to link to that playlist and you can learn how to make beef bone broth, chicken bone broth, pork bone broth, fish bone broth, a whole host of bone broths. And I get this question a lot and I wanna let you know, you can mix bones together anytime you want. If you've got a few beef bones and a couple of chicken feet, if you're not comfortable working with chicken feet, I understand completely. You can use chicken necks, chicken backs, reasonably priced pieces of chicken, and you can mix them with some of the more expensive beef bone broths, but with a 15% discount at US Wellness Meats, it makes it a little more affordable. So know that you have a lot of options when it comes to making bone broth. Now, one thing I wanna share with you, this is a piece of equipment that I absolutely could not live without. This, and many of you have told me, was a game changer when it came to making bone broth. This is a fat separator, but it's not any old fat separator. It's the most clever fat separator I've ever used. You put your bone broth right in here, and then it has a little thumb depressor and you press this down and you can put this over your jar or whatever uh, in whatever you're decanting your bone broth into and you just watch until the fat because the fat is risen to the top you watch until it gets down to the bottom where the fat is still in the fat separator but all of your bone broth has drained out into your vessel so now you have perfectly clear delightfully defatted bone broth that can be used in any type of recipe but then, yes, I know many of you have said, don't throw the fat out. You know I would never throw the fat out. What you can do then is get a different vessel and then just decant your fat into that. So now if you've made beef bone broth, you've got some wonderful beef fat, it's great for frying. If you've made chicken bone broth and you've got your chicken fat, that's schmaltz, it's wonderful, it's very flavorful and can be used in a lot of different ways and pork fat, I mean, it's just endless variety of fat that you can have whenever you make bone broth. Even if you've mixed beef bones and chicken or pork, whatever the case may be, that fat is definitely worth saving and very usable. 
but I love this because I like to separate the fat from my beef bone broth or my chicken bone broth, whatever I'm making. I make a lot of beef bone broth, but whatever I'm making. And that way I have a beautiful clear broth that I can use in place of water when making soups and stews, in place of water when I'm cooking grains like rice or other whole grains. It makes it a very versatile liquid. And of course, when bone broth is defatted, it makes a wonderful sipping broth. Now, a few other tools that really help make making bone broth an easy job is to have some kind of spider strainer like this, as well as a flour sack towel. You've heard me talk about these a lot. I love these in place of cheesecloth because these can be rinsed out in your sink and then washed with your other dishcloths. And then having some type of strainer, a mesh strainer or a colander, whatever you have, is nice because what I like to do is line my mesh strainer with my flour sack towel and then strain my bone broth through this. So any little, even I've used my spider strainer, you know, to take out the bones and the vegetables, whatever's in there. Then I like to strain it through this and it just gets that little bit of debris, little bits and bobs that maybe uh, you're not able to get out with your spider strainer. Then from the bowl, then I'll decant it into my fat separator and then I have the perfect, beautiful, clear bone broth that I'll just go ahead and decant down into my jar or whatever vessel I'm saving it in. So all of these tools come in very handy. Can you use cheesecloth? Of course. If you have a very busy household and you just want to use cheesecloth, which is disposable, I understand that completely. But if you're like me and you like things that you can reuse again and again and again, some of these are 20 years old, so they definitely hold up beautifully. And many of you have asked me, how do I wash these? Well, I used to wash these with just some very mild, unscented detergent in my washing machine and uh, with my other white dishcloths, and I would use some bleach. And I have to say, you all gave me the best advice ever. Said instead of bleach, because that can wear them out and cause them to get little holes and whatnot, use vinegar. Now remember, never mix bleach and vinegar together. That's a disaster. But a little scented, unscented detergent and some vinegar is going to get these beautifully cleaned. Now I just want to take a minute to share with you what I like to do when it comes to warming bone broth that I enjoy using as a sipping broth. I found this pot and I absolutely love this. This is actually called a fourth burner pot. If you have a stove that has that small burner and you're always wondering what's the best pot to put on that, they have made these what they call fourth burner pots. And they're so clever because now I'm going to use this for bone broth. However, it also comes with this little uh, like a strainer of sorts that you can put asparagus in, you could put maybe three corn, uh, corn on the cobs in. So there's different things that you can do with this and make use, make very good use of that fourth small burner on your stove. But I really love this because it can be used in so many ways because it has all the markings inside, one cup, two cup, three cup, so on and so forth. So I can fill this with, with as much bone broth I think I'm going to need and then I can just put my lid on and then put this on the stove and warm it and enjoy it as a sipping broth. And this lid locks in place so it's easy to, to just, as you can see, it's locked in place. It's easy to pour and it's got these little uh, holes here that let you pour it very easily and then you just can put your lid back on and lock it in place. Go ahead and put this in your refrigerator with any leftover bone broth you have, it, have in here and then bring it back out onto your, onto your stove and warm up your bone broth again. Now if you don't have this particular little pot, which I think is very clever, but if you don't have this but you have a, a teapot that's a glass teapot or an enamel teapot that's made to go on the stove, my friend Michelle over at Chocolate Box Cottage keeps her bone broth in that fashion. And then she just puts her bone broth in there, she's got it in the fridge, and when she needs it, she just transfers it to her stove and warms it up just like that. So you've got some options as to how you want to warm your bone broth. But this really solves the problem of what many of you have shared with me. Oh, I have this big jar. What do I do now? Do I, you know, because it's very gelatinous and whatnot. 
just storing it in here in your fridge if you're going to use it within the week it's perfect. Now I'm focused on the stock pot, however, can you make bone broth in a slow cooker or some sort of multi-pot like an instant pot? Definitely. And I have lots of videos where I show you how to do that. Number five, let's talk about home canning. If you're new to home canning, I think the best and maybe the easiest place to get started is with water bath canning. Now what I've got here are two types of water bath canners that are made for the stovetop. Now, are there electric water bath canners? Yes, definitely. And I have one. But the reason I'm not sharing it with you and recommending it is because I've had a little trouble with the lid. And I want to share that information with you. I think an electric water bath canner can be great. The only problem I ran into with the specific one I had was that the lid is glass and it got a crack in it. But the manufacturer was fantastic and they did send me a replacement lid. So that was a nice thing to have. But I just wonder if going forward, if I might get another crack. And so that kind of worries me a little. So I really do prefer to make sure that I have stovetop water bath canners on hand. Now, what's the difference between the two of these? Because clearly they look very different. This is an enameled water bath canner and it comes with a rack inside that you would put your canning jars in once they were filled and then you would lower them down into the hot water and then put it this on your stove top, bring it up to a boil and boil them for whatever uh, time is recommended uh, in your canning recipe. This type of water bath canner is best for a gas stove or that has the burners, the, the um, cast iron type burners or a coiled electric stove. And the reason is, is the bottom of these type of canners is often not completely flat. Sometimes there's just a little mild indentation like this, and sometimes they're actually quite concave. In most cases, the manufacturers of those flat glass top type stoves don't recommend using this type of water bath canner on them because it can create some type of suction and potentially crack the glass top stove. In that case, you're best off with a canner like this, a water bath canner that has a completely flat bottom. This works beautifully, and that's the type of stove I have uh, is a glass top stove. And I've used this on it, and it works great. This also comes with a rack, and you put your jars in the same way you would with the enameled uh, water bath canner. Now, in addition to your water bath canners, you're going to want to have some basic supplies on hand, obviously, like canning jars. A bowl makes wonderful canning jars. This is a WEC canning jar. This is kind of a European style with the little clamps. It's kind of fun to uh, home can with those. Uh, but you have a lot of options. And then you want to have your lids uh, and your rings, or some people call them bands, uh, if you have the ball type canning jars. And so that's what you want to make sure that you have on hand in different sizes before you start water bath canning. You'll also have things like a debubbler and different little tools that are going to help you with the process. But the one that I want to focus on here that I just think is wonderful is this spring-loaded jar lifter. Now, are there jar lifters that don't have the spring loading? Yes, and can you use that? Definitely. But these are just terrific because they give such a secure hold to your jar and then a very uh, secure release. Now, if you buy a kit of home canning supplies, sometimes, as I mentioned, they will come with your water bath canners, like including the debubbler and a little magnetized jar lifter, things like that, something for measuring headspace. Sometimes your debubbler will have the little ruler on it for measuring headspace. And those usually come in a kit. And in that kit, they will have a jar lifter, but it's not gonna be one of these spring loading type. These are often sold separately. But if you do get one of those kits, and as I said, they're very affordable, uh, you may wanna go ahead and add in getting a separate jar lifter, because I, I can't say enough good things about this, because this has really saved the day. Uh, many times the traditional jar lifter, it can be easy to 
not 100% get the right grip, at least in my case. But this makes always uh, makes me feel very secure. So I highly recommend this. And this would be, as we go into the holidays, this is a terrific uh, stocking stuffer for anyone who is a home canner. This is one thing that I wanted to share with you. If you like home canning, maybe like making jams and homemade jams and jellies and then canning them up and giving them as gifts, I think these little wax papers are so adorable. They can be used for a lot of things like wrapping food and maybe wrapping homemade candies, but you can cut these and use these as the decorative paper on top of a canning jar and just tie it with a string. And I love these because they look, this particular one looks like little wild strawberries with little leaves attached. And I thought, how perfect is this paper for using for a homemade strawberry jam and making your jars look very pretty and perfect for gift giving. So I'll be sure to put a link to this in the description below. Number six, storage. How do we keep our foods and our homemade meals as fresh as possible? Well, I know you've shared with me that you're concerned about plastic and were there options for storing food in glass that would really keep the food fresh? And I'm happy to share with you that there is. Now, many of us love our food saver and we've been using that for years, but it does require storing foods in plastic bags and plastic containers. Now they are BPA free, so that's good. But for those of you who really prefer storing your food in glass, I wanted to share this option with you that's called the Zwilling. This basically operates on the very similar process that we know from using the little handheld food saver. It's basically the same thing, but the only difference is you're gonna be using glass containers. Now I'm gonna do a follow-up video where I talk about the pros and cons between Food Saver and between Zwilling, but I think if you like storing things in glass, you're going to love this system and you're gonna love these. And Zwilling really offers you the best of both worlds because they also do have the plastic bags that you can seal food in as well if you're comfortable doing that. And these plastic bags come in a variety of sizes. And when it comes to these glass containers, they come in a variety of sizes too. I've just got two here to share with you, but there are some that are smaller and some that are larger, and even some that look basically like a casserole dish. So there's a lot of options for how you can store your food and keep it fresh. And the good news is they guarantee that whatever you put in here and use their little device to seal this up tight and get it airtight, so to speak, that it should stay fresh five times longer than if you weren't pour, putting it in a container like this. Well, in addition to number seven that we're gonna talk about now, I do have a bonus item for you that no traditional foods cook should be without. This holiday season, give the gift of stories and recipes with my new book, The Modern Pioneer Cookbook, available everywhere books are sold. But before we get into the bonus item, let's talk about number seven, clean up. Every home cook at some point has to clean up. If not ourselves, somebody else in the family. And the easier we can make the job, all the better. Well, I know we're all really concerned about using too many paper products and chemicals and so on and so forth in our homes. So what I wanted to share with you was some really earth-friendly products. I have to share with you about these Swedish dishcloths. I love these things. They're very reasonably priced and they can literally replace paper towels. I do keep some paper towels on hand, but I try to use them very little. Instead, I use these. And what is so fantastic is that these can absorb so much liquid, just a little thing like this, that it, it, it's going to expand and absorb lots of liquid and be an amazing cleanup uh, powerhouse or workhorse in your kitchen. Now, I especially like the ones from this company. And as I said, all of, none of this is sponsored. All of these are things that I buy, products that I love. 
And this is the Super Scandi, which is cute, Super Scandi uh, company. And this is just a family owned business. I think things like this, they just make wonderful presents. These would make great stocking stuffers. And they come with a note, which I think is very sweet. And it says, thank you so much for supporting our small family business. Warmest Jenna. So I think that's, that just makes everything very nice. But what's great is these simply come like this with this little cardboard uh, holder, just like this, nothing fancy. And what's great is the packaging, this piece is completely recyclable. And these are compostable. So it's just the best of all worlds. Now I like to just have these in this off white color, but they come in a whole host of colors. I mean, everything that you could imagine. Plus there are a lot of variety when it comes to using these Swedish type dishcloths. And you can get ones that go with the season, which of course is very cute. But what can be really nice is you can get ones with pictures on them that can help you designate them as to how they're going to be used in your home. As you know, I have a dog. I love our Indy. He's just such a gem, but he can be a little bit of a messy guy. And having something like this that has dogs on it that I can use to clean up messes. You know, he splatters water everywhere when he drinks. He's a typical boy. But these are great. And then I know, okay, these are for the dog and these are going to be kept in a separate area. So if you've really been trying to work on cutting down on buying paper products, specifically paper towels, you can't go wrong with these Swedish dishcloths. As I said, they're very affordable and they last for such a long time. You can reuse and reuse and reuse and reuse and they stay sanitary. And when you feel that maybe they're on their last leg, just throw them in your compost. And I actually have to say again that I said that the cardboard was recyclable. This is compostable too. It's also, it's made from cornstarch. It's amazing. The other thing I want to share with you is about these soaps. They're very unique. They're not actually soap that you're, I guess you could wash your hands with them, but they're not actually soaps in the traditional way. When we think about a bar of soap, these are actually made for washing your dishes and they last a really long time and you don't, you no longer will need liquid uh, dishwashing liquid. <laughs> you can recycle the box. You don't have to worry about any plastic. And then you put this bar of soap on this little, what do you call soap dish that it comes with. But how clever is this soap dish? You put this on the edge of your sink and it, see it's sealed on this side but it's open on this side. And so you put your soap here, it keeps your little bar of soap dry and the, and it drains off into the sink. So you, it's not as though it's going to make your, the counter area around your sink wet. Then when you go to wash your dishes, all you do is take your dish brush or your dish rag or your sponge, whatever you use, just soap up and go ahead and clean up. And that's it. They also provide you with a little all natural scrubbing brush and this thing works terrific. You just soap up and use this. It's not very harsh at all, but it's really great at loosening anything that may be sticking to your frying pan or your baking dish, whatever the case may be. And the dish soaps that they offer come in three different fragrances. The one I've got here is lemon. They also have grapefruit and they have pine. So this is a wonderful option to consider if you want to just get away from any of the liquid dishwashing liquids uh, that come in plastic containers. Next, I want to share with you about my favorite microfiber cloths. These ones are really unique. I saved the packaging so that I could share this with you because I just think this is so terrific. It says that they remove bacteria from surfaces with just water. So you really could do away with a lot of cleaning products. And what they explain is that first of all, it's called the Renew brand. These are all made from a recycled, 100% recycled materials, specifically plastic. So they're recycling plastic. And what they explain on the box is that the fibers are woven so close together 
that the bacteria basically has nowhere to hide. I think it's kind of cute. It says the Renew collection brings you the magic of microfiber without making a mess of planet Earth. Made from GRS certified recycled plastic, each cloth is designed to tackle a different household task. And they've got handy loops and labels, I'll show you in a minute, for easy storage and even easier use for magical chemical free cleaning. Well, how can you go wrong with that? And here's the loop that I'm talking about. So wherever you use this to clean, you can hang this up on a little hook and let it air dry and it's ready for its job next time. And also on the loop is printed what this cloth is made to be used for. And this one is specifically an all purpose. So this is great. You can use this to wipe down your counters. You can use this to clean glass. You use this to clean your uh, shower doors, mirrors, whatever the case may be. This is an all purpose one. And as you'll see, all three of mine are all purpose. I really like the all purpose because as the name implies, I can really just use them anywhere I need to. Uh, there are others sometimes that are specifically made uh, for say like washing windows and taking care of things like that. But really I have found that the all purpose ones work great on whatever surface you wanna use them on as long as it's a solid surface. They do share on the back that these are specifically for hard, non-porous surfaces like glass, ceramic, metal. You can use them to clean your stainless steel pots. They're wonderful. Varnished wood and plastic. And the bonus item, a cast iron skillet. Every self-respecting modern pioneer in the kitchen needs one. And it doesn't matter if you got it at a garage sale and you season it yourself like this old one, or you buy one pre-seasoned. Make sure you've got a good cast iron skillet in your kitchen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that variety of kitchen tools for the traditional foods cook. Now, if you would like to see recipes for everything that I shared in the first section for how to make that whole host of homemade Christmas gifts or gifts really for any time of year, be sure to click on this video over here where I have all those recipes and more. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.